Amen. Thank you, Drew. Good morning to everyone. Stand with me if you would. Take a hymnal if you like to use those things. 488, the words will also be on the overhead. Join with me as he keeps me singing. 488, only one way to sing this. Lean back a little bit. Just let her come out, okay? 488, he keeps me singing. Shake hands with one another. find your way back to your seat, <clears throat> you may be seated. Thank you. It's good to have Jimmy back with us today. Jimmy spent a little bit of time in the ER this past week. Good to have him back with us. You might notice that Bill and Sandy are missing, as well as Rob and Susan. Uh, Susan has COVID, and also Bill does. They've both been diagnosed. Bill's rather se serious, um, and so keep him in prayer. Um, a lot of issues going around with different things, and so keep them in prayer, and I know that they'd appreciate that. Uh, the one that sang last Sunday, uh, Dave, Big Dave up here, uh, was rushed to the hospital this uh, past week, and he is in Miami Valley. They will make a determination Tuesday whether they're going to do 
uh, a stint uh, on a, a blockage that he has or if he will do again open heart surgery. So keep him in mind if you would. Uh, he is on a holiday weekend. You just, that's the highest priced hotel you can get a hospital. Amen. And, uh, but that's, uh, no one's there to really make those decisions. So I, do, I doubt that anything will be done until Tuesday. Um, he's in real good spirits. Keep him in prayer. I know that he appreciate it. And don't forget, Danny, if uh, you're a card writer or if you'd like to visit, he is at Fairhaven, room 110. He would love to have you visit. And right along to his side is uh, his sidekick, uh, Alice. And I know that, well, hi, buddy. I know, I know that Alice would appreciate you being there with him, too. Uh, stop in and stay for just a while. Uh, Danny has a, a little bit of confusion still from the surgery, so don't be surprised if he starts talking to you about something that's not existing. Um, I've learned as I've aged, John, you wouldn't know this, but as I've aged, I've noticed I start talking about things that don't exist either. So uh, uh, as you age, you, anybody listen, you just keep talking. But anyway, uh, keep them in prayer if you would. And uh, it's very good today to have uh, with us. Uh, we've all been so interested in CORE and what's happening. Uh, Vice President of CORE is with us today, and it's good to have him, Doug, and your daughter uh, with us, and uh, make sure you get that over there, shake hands with them, and let them know you appreciate him being with us. Um, I think that's uh, all of the prayer requests. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we humble ourselves before you, Lord, for we know that with all the might and all the strength that we have, we cannot improve or alter or change life circumstances at all. That the only one that can do that is you. And so, Lord, we come before you and realize that if uh, you don't intervene, nothing will happen. So, Father, we pray for these that we have mentioned that are sick, others that are in a hospital or a nursing home. Ask, Lord, that you'd be with each one of them, minister the needs that they have, and help them, Lord, especially those with COVID, that they would recover quickly without further uh, serious incident. Uh, Lord, just be with them and their loved ones and their sphere of uh, friends, as uh, we know that uh, from what we've been told, if there's truth to it, that it is a disease that is communicated, uh, rather transmitted easily. So I pray, Father, that you'd be with all the families of those who've been affected. Be with our country, Lord. Uh, we are in such a situation, and we just pray, Father, that your will would be done. Lord, we look for the day that we are able to proclaim the truth of Christ uh, without intervention and without harassment uh, throughout the whole world. We pray, Father, that you'd be with those that are under severe attack in many places, certainly our good friends in India who have been so faithful for the past four or five years of joining us each Sunday morning now find themselves locked out. I pray that you'd be with them. Um, and I pray, Father, that you'd minister the needs. Sometimes it's not just that you can't go, it's that you can't get fed. And I pray, Father, that you'd be with them in their, their need right now. Father, we pray also for those around the world, uh, people that believe in you, who for their faith are being tested severely. And I pray, Father, that you'd be with them. Now with us, as we sit here in air conditioned and padded pews, Help us, Lord, not to complain, but to uh, refrain the greatness of our God. Over and over and over again, magnify your precious name. Thank you, Lord, for saving our soul. Uh, Father, I thank you for being near to us in our time of calamity. And pray, Father, that you'd march marvelously in our midst today as we sing, as we testify, as we hear your word. We'll give you praise for all that's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. And now we have special music.
Thank you, Drew. Appreciate that. Uh, took me back in a memory many, many years ago. I know I don't look like I have that many years under me, but uh, many years ago, I remember sitting in a, a storefront um, in uh, the Indiana area. I'd been asked to come and start a house church, and we had moved out of their house uh, through growth, and we were in a storefront, and uh, there we sat, and uh, how I would have longed to have heard the songs of Zion on a piano. The only thing they had was my big mouth, and they wanted a piano too. <laughs> Amen? Uh, but what a beautiful thing. Uh, we often take so much for granted are the things that we have until you don't have them anymore. Drew, thank you so much. That was a beautiful rendition of Breathe on Me, Breath of God. And now a great song, 512. I don't know how well you know this, but stand with me if you would. Uh, this is a great, great old hymn, My Savior's Love. I Second stanza. seated. Thank you very much. I served at a church many years ago. They know I like to sing, like Christian music, and they thought if they sing enough 
and get me to sing enough, the sermon would be shorter. Uh, you know, run out of my voice and stuff. So right in the middle of it, uh, you've seen Dave every once in a while. He'll say, Pastor, can we sing that, that chorus one more time? But that's what they do. 298. And I, I'd, I'd go right along with it. 298. Let's sing it. We'd sing all four stanzas. I'd put that down, get my, my Bible out. 442. <laughs> and I'd, I'd get back the hymn book at 442. What they caught on real quick is it didn't matter how many songs we sang. The sermon was still the same length, amen, <laughs> and uh, that didn't last very long, amen. They, they decided to go a different direction. Uh, wonderful, wonderful to be with you today and wonderful to have the opportunity to sing those songs. Um, if you've never been in an environment before where there's just like eight of you and you're in someone's front living room and you don't have any music, all you have is the people you know as family. And you're thinking about this world and its situation. And you're thinking about your bond together in Christ Jesus. Those songs take on a little different flavor. As we sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder... <laughs> why he would love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. And there's only one thing you can say after you consider that, oh, how marvelous, <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Now, <clears throat> I cannot say for everyone, but I know where I got into this Christian thing at. It was on complete failure on my part. As the saying goes, all the wheels had come off of the, the boat. I was in desperate need of help. And as the psalmist ran, penned, in my distress, I cried unto the Lord. And oh, how wonderful, oh, how marvelous is my Savior's love for me. He heard my cry. When anything about me that would ever get his attention, except for the fact that I was a sinner without hope and without God. And the songs that we sing are not just fillers. They're not just music. But they're the anthem of the heart of God's people. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Now, <clears throat> I'm 50 years old in the Lord, and I want to think that His marvelous, wonderful love for me has never waned or grown old or lessened. If anything, every year that goes by, I am more amazed that he would love me. Everything that I do, quote unquote, for him is tarnished with this sin. Every, every advantage I try to gain for Christ, you don't see it, but I do, is tarnished by sin. And so, when I look deep into my own heart and my own mind, it's easy for me to say, oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. <clears throat> so, I don't know where you got in on this Christian thing, but I didn't get in on the top floor. I got in on the bottom where God took what could have been a soul uh, condemned to hell and not afraid to tarnish his hand, he reached down for me and gave me something worth living for. And I hope that you feel the same to some capacity this morning. <clears throat> that's not the sermon, that's just a primer. Amen? Now, if I can get this to work... Let's try. 
There we go. So, <clears throat> if you did not bring your Bible today, there's a pew Bible in front of you. It looks kind of like this. And uh, conveniently in the notes that are in your bulletin are the actual page numbers for you to consider. And then you can follow along with us. The reason I, I do that is because I do not want you to take my words <clears throat> as gospel truth. There's only one truth, and it's found in the covers of the book that you hold in your hand right now. And I want you to see it come from there. I would never intentionally mislead you, <clears throat> but I want you to find it in there. Page 761 in that Bible, and it will help you as you follow along with us today. We're going to read one verse of Scripture and then preach four hours on that. Isn't that exciting? Amen. All right, three and a half. I'm sorry, I exaggerated. 761, one verse of Scripture, and it's found there in our great study on Philippians. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. Follow along, if you would, with me there. Verse 21, <clears throat> Paul comes down through this great chapter, chapter 3, and he concludes in verse 21, uh, speaking of God, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now I'm going to tell <clears throat> on Brett. Brett texted me this last week. And uh, what, what did you ask me? I can't remember the text. Will we recognize one another in heaven or something like that? And I tortured him. I said, that's Sunday's sermon. You'll have to wait. And he laughed. And I didn't laugh back. He said, are you serious? <laughs> so uh, this is for you, Brad. Amen. All right. <clears throat> I would like to speak to you today from this verse of Scripture, the metamorphosis of the Christian. Isn't that a great, great scientific name? Amen. Last week, if you were here, we spoke <clears throat> about being homesick for heaven. And we noticed three confessions of the homesick. Number one, I want to go home. Number two, I want my mommy. And number three, I want my own bed. Each of those focused on a portion of the scripture that we looked at in Paul's address of spiritual homesickness in verses 20 and 21. It involved a familiarity of home. The reason so many Christians today are not homesick is they don't know anything about heaven. How can you be homesick for something you're not familiar with? In a day where the Bible becomes the last thing we ever use as a reference book, why in the world would a Christian ever be homesick? Unless they've watched Touched by an Angel or something like that, and then they've got a really spiritual, clear view of what heaven's like. Amen? I'm just kidding. I'm being sarcastic. Amen? The only heaven that most of us know are from Hollywood, and they have no clue what heaven is. But the Bible tells us a lot about heaven, but in order for us to be homesick, we have to be familiar with it. <clears throat> it also spoke to us about a desire for relationship. I want my mommy. We want our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that fascination, that allurement <clears throat> with something that you don't have, and that has to do with <clears throat> what Paul moved on to in the last verse, who shall change our vile body. Paul summarizes the change as something that you do with the body that contrasts a vial with glorious. If you look up the screen for a minute, this is verse 21. I've just changed and highlighted some of the marks there. Who shall change, that's the subject, that's the metamorphosis. Who shall change our, look at the contrast, vile body, that it may be fashioned like it is glorious body. That's the contrast, vile versus glorious. We often talk about going to heaven and all, but what does Paul mean when he says that God is going to change us from vile to glorious? And that's what we're going to investigate. Now, I just want to give you fair warning. We're going a little deep today. It'll be like dry toast, all right? I'm sorry, but there's no other way to get to it other than that. And uh, uh, think of this as a smorgasbord. You go through, pick out the things that you can get. Don't worry about the things that you don't. God will add to it later on, all right? So if you don't follow me all the way through, don't fall asleep on me. That's really disappointing. I preach three hours longer if you fall asleep. I'm just kidding. But uh, I know it's going to be a little dry, but it's specific, it's biblical, and I want you to see it this morning. What 
is it about the change from glorious or from vile to glorious? And that's what I want to look at. First of all, I want you to consider with me the meaning of the word changed in verse 21. And with this meaning, uh, understanding the meaning, we're going to ask, answer the why question. The why question. The change Paul mentioned here is described by contrast. We just noticed it. But what does, but does not answer the why that we need to be changed. Why do we need to be changed? So let me give you a little better background if I can. We have an image problem. And I'm not talking about mirror, mirror on the wall image kind. I'm talking about a bigger image problem. Let me explain. Turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. It's page 1 in your, your uh, pew Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And while you're turning there, let me ask you this question. In whose image was Adam made? In whose image was Adam made? Let's look at the verses right here. And God said, verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his what? own image in the what image image of God created he him male and female created he them in what uh, in what image was Adam created he was created in the image of God but something happened something terrible happened look if you would with me at Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 17 which is page 2 Adam died Notice what it says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely, what? Die. Adam was created in God's image, but he partook of the fruit that he was commanded not to take of, and in disobedience, Adam died. Now, it's interesting, Adam didn't die physically. In fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 5, look at what it says there. All the days of Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Adam didn't die physically when he ate the fruit. Uh, He continued. He fathered children. He lived a total of 930 years. He didn't die physically. What happened is he died spiritually. He died spiritually. And we see this in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, it's page 686 in that Bible. 686. I'll give you a second to turn there. I want you to see this. You're probably familiar with the story. It's wonderful to see it in print. Page 686. Adam died spiritually. This is what verse 3 begins. Jesus answered and said unto him, Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then the last part, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And then he illustrates it. The wind bloweth where it listeth, where you see it blowing around. Now here's the sound thereof. Cannot not tell whence it cometh or whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now this is interesting. Adam died, but not physically. He died spiritually. At the creation of Adam, he was body, soul, and spirit. But when he partook of the fruit, disobeyed God, God took his spirit from Adam. And he was now just body and soul. He died spiritually. So everyone born after Adam's image, according to Genesis chapter 5 verse 3, that's page 3, 
Turn to page 3. I need you to see this. Everyone that's born after Adam's fall, I know this will go against many people, but the Bible trumps anybody. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, this is what it says. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his what? Own likeness after his image. We are not all children of God. We are not born after the image of God. We are born after Adam's image. We have an image problem. The image of Adam is stained with sin. And most importantly, God took his spirit from Adam. He died spiritually. So everyone born after him is void of God's spirit. This is the reason that we must be born again. That goes back to John 3. We're not going to turn back there again. But where Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Because you have a void or dead spirit. You must be born again. Again, and this is the reason Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ, our personal Savior, God gives his Spirit back to us. And then we are three again. Humankind can be restored back to God's image. We accept Christ our Savior. God gives us his spirit again, and now we're body, soul, and spirit. You must be born again. And one of the reasons for the change that Paul mentions in verse 21 of chapter 3 of Philippians is because we have an image problem We have lost the image of God through sin, and it must be regained through new birth. That's the reason we preach about getting saved, or or asking Christ to be your Savior, or being born again. My grandma, she was from the old school. And I think I told you before, we... When she got old and she couldn't live by herself, we tried to build a little place in our our home for Grandma to to be. And Grandma was an old school. She told it right as she saw it. And uh, she came to the dinner table one night. She said, I can't live here any longer. We thought it was something that we had done. We said, oh, Grandma, what have we done? What have we done? She said, can't live here. Everybody in here has been born it again. That's how she said it. Born it again. And, and we looked at her with our eyes wide open. She said, I need to go in a nursing home where there's somebody that hadn't been born it again so I can tell them about Jesus. And sure enough, she wouldn't, re- she wouldn't relent. We took her back to the nursing home. She uh, crocheted a saddlebag on each one of her wheelchair arms. In one side, she had hymn books. In the other one, she had her Bible and bi- gospel tract. You should have heard her tell the story. When I wheel that into the wheel or into the door, they can't get out. I'm stuck here with my wheelchair. They can't get out. And I say, anybody in here been born it again? And they'd look at me kind of weird. And she'd say, if they looked at me weird, I knew that they weren't. Because if they'd looked at me right, I'd known they was. And that's just how she was. And she'd sit there. I'd say, well, how long do you sit there? Till they get born it again. I thought, that's my grandma. Only she could do that. Amen. That's the reason we say you must be born again. It's not a Baptist thing. It's not a thing we do as Christians necessarily. It's something we do because we have an image problem. We died. In Adam's image, we died spiritually. We need to be born again by the Spirit of God. An image problem. But not only did Adam have an image problem, he had a flesh problem too. Adam's body, his flesh, changed. Even though Adam didn't die physically, something happened to his body when he disobeyed God in the garden. We're told in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, when God created Adam, this is what it says. I'll let you get there. It's page 2. like for you when you follow along. I like to hear the crinkling of the pages. That's a wonderful sound. That, I, I shouldn't lie, that causes preachers to preach shorter. When he hears a crinkling of the pages, amen. You know that's not true. But notice what it says there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, notice this, and breathed into his nostrils, what? The breath of life. 
When God created Adam, he created his life through the breath of the Spirit of God. Adam and Eve walked in the garden in the presence of the Lord, and their life was the breath of God. But when Adam sinned, something terrible happened. And we find it over here in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11. That's page 86. Turn there. This is so important. Page 86. Something terrible happened when Adam sinned and as a result died spiritually. Look what became the life of the flesh. Not the breath of God because the breath of God was taken out when they sinned. Look what it says here. For the life of the flesh is in the what? The blood. When Adam sinned, his life went from the breath of God to his blood. And you know what we know about blood? We know that blood is corruptible. That's why we embalm people when they die. That is why meat must be refrigerated. Blood is corruptible. And I just want you to see this truth found over in 1 Corinthians 15, page 746. Page 746 in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. This is such an important thing. Not only did he have an image problem, but he had a flesh problem. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, this is what it says. Now this I say, brethren... That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Let me just say to you, if, if you don't have the Spirit of God as life, and instead you have just blood as the life of the flesh, you cannot go to heaven. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We have a flesh problem, and it's not just that we're sinful, it's, it's that we're corrupted. Imagine a block of hamburger sitting on your ca kitchen counter saying, well, I don't want to be corrupted. Just leave me out of the refrigerator. I, I reject the idea that I am corrupt. And wait around for about five weeks. And see what happens. Doesn't matter all the willpower and the men, all the... I deny all, you can do all of that. You are not going to escape the fact that there is corruption in blood. And if the only way you have to exist in this life is blood, you are corruptible. And I'm corruptible. That's the reason Paul said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither can corruption inherit incorruption. This is a truth of the Word of God. This is why it is so important to understand in order to go to heaven, something must change in the flesh. Change. That's what Paul said. Change from vile to glory. Adam was created with the breath of God, but when he disobeyed God, something changed. God's spirit was taken from him and corruptible blood became his life. And in order to return to God, two things had to be reversed or changed. A change had to occur first. A change with regard to the spirit of God. He needed the new birth. The new birth. At the moment we were changed, as God gave his spirit to us, according to John chapter 3, which we've already read, when God gave his spirit to us, we were changed. We were born again. That is a change that was necessary. We needed new birth. The second change is yet to occur. And we find this over there in 1 Corinthians 15, where we just were. I know it's a lot of turning, but please enjoy it with me if you would. Page 746. We not, not only need to be changed spiritually so that we have God's spirit, but we need to change bodily, physically, fleshly. Notice what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to begin in verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says it again, right? Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. You know what that means? Not everybody's familiar with this. It's a mystery. 
And this is the mystery. We shall not all sleep. In the Bible, sleep is often a picture of death. He said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be, say the word with me, changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall say it with me again, be changed. For this corruptible, there's the blood, must put on incorruption. And this mortal, you know where we get that word? Mortuary. Mortal. The funeral home. This mortal must put on immortality. Then notice the next one. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal, well, I'm not perfect, right? It's kind of a typo there. Uh, shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is read, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, the judgment Adam received in Genesis 2.17 can be remedied. As mentioned in this last verse, our death can be swallowed up in victory. We need a physical change. And that's what the Bible is talking about here. We not only need to be changed spiritually, but we need to be changed physically. Notice this change described in a few verses before these verses. It's found in chapter 15, beginning in verse 43. Notice this if you would. Speaking of the flesh or the body, it is sown in dishonor. Who's that? That's Adam. We inherited Adam's image. It's a sinful image. We were sown in dishonor. But if we know Christ our Savior, it is raised in glory. Remember the words, vile body, glorious body? There's the glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Do you remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus? Jesus said, that which is of the flesh is flesh, and that which is the spirit is spirit. The flesh is the natural body. It's sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first, we're right back at Genesis chapter 1. The first Adam was made a living soul, and then they were introduced to this last Adam. The last Adam in the Bible is Jesus. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now, I want to give you just a little thing here. Are you all still with me, partly? All right. Think of this. Adam didn't take the fruit. Eve did. And Adam loved his wife so much that he was not deceived. He intentionally took the fruit and ate of it because he loved his wife so much that he died for her. First Adam. Jesus, the second Adam, had no sin, but he became sin for us because he loved us so much that he died, not for his own sins, but for who he called his bride, his church. He loved us so much. The parallels between the two, the first Adam becomes the picture of the second Adam. And that's the reason Paul in this wonderful chapter, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, said the first, of the last Adam, uh, or the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. And then he goes on and he says this, howbeit it was not first which was spiritual, Adam wasn't spiritual, but it was, he was natural. And afterwards, Jesus is the one that was spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. Who's that? Adam. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Who's that? Jesus Christ. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. We're made in his image. And as is the heavenly, Jesus, such are they also that are heavenly. We get the image of God back. Now notice what it says. This draws it all together. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we were all Adam's image. We accept Christ, our personal Savior. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, I don't know how many of you just followed what I just said. Some of you look a bit confused 
or stressed, all right? But this is the beautiful picture of God. The problem with man is his image. He lost God's spirit, and he needs to be born again so that he can have God's spirit. And even that is not all, because this body is tainted with sin, and its blood is corruptible. And so God says, I have to change both the spirit and the flesh. One is corruptible, and the new birth is the only thing that will make it incorruptible. And now, verse 49, that image. Once again, we will bear the image of God, body, soul, and spirit, without the corruption of the flesh. Now, all of that said, is man... The reason that they, we need to be changed is because we have an image problem and we have a flesh problem. We need a new body. Now, we're just about done. I know that was my first point. I usually preach longer, but I'm going to preach shorter because I don't want everyone to go to sleep. All right. We know the meaning of the change. What's the manner of the change? The manner of the change This answers the what question. The change Paul mentioned here is described by contrast, not as vile, but glorious or glorified. So what do we know about this glorified or glorious body? It's illustrated to us, for us, in Matthew chapter number 17, and that's page 631 in the Bible that you have there in the Pew Bible, page 631. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. This is a great passage of Scripture. In Sunday school today, we looked at it, and I told them, I said, don't get too familiar with this because it's a sermon. Hopefully they didn't. Matthew chapter 17. Notice this. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured. Do you know what transfigured means? Changed in form. Jesus was transfigured before them. You know what this means? That Jesus who they knew as the Nazarene, the carpenter son, was transfigured before them and changed in form to his glorified body, the one that came back after the resurrection of Jesus. Notice how he looked. His face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as light. This is not the meek and lowly Galilean. This is the glorified Christ as he returns. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elias. These are the two that appeared with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. And while Peter yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, notice the next part. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now, this is very interesting because from this passage of Scripture and also in John chapter 21, we learn some things about a glorified body. First of all, it can be recognized. When Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, it was Peter that said, Jesus. He recognized Jesus among the three as Jesus wears recognition in a glorified body. Someone's asked me many times, will we recognize one another in heaven? Well, of course you'll recognize one another in heaven. I mean, Peter, James, and John recognized Jesus in his glorified body, recognized Moses, recognized Elias or Elijah. There's understanding in heaven. Verse 7, uh, Jesus said, don't be afraid. They said, oh. Jesus touched them, said, rise up. There was understanding. In chapter 21, we don't have time to go there because of the sake of time, but in chapter 21 of John, verse 12 through 15, they ate, 
They traveled and they interacted. In a glorified body, we will recognize one another. We will understand one another. We will eat. Uh, every Baptist likes that part. Amen. Uh, we'll eat. We'll travel together. We'll interact together in a glorified body. The manner. What does it mean to be changed? Now, while this is not exhaustive, it does give us a little insight into this glorious body. Why did Paul say we needed to be changed? We're vile, and we need to be changed into a glory, glorious body. Very quickly, notice finally, the moment, the moment of change. This answers the when question. When will all of this change occur? I'm going to ask you to go back. There's about three more scriptures, and then we'll be done today. Go back, if you would, with me to 1 Corinthians 15, page 746. Page 746, 1 Corinthians 15, and notice verse 51 and verse 52. When will this all happen? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Remember, sleep is used in the Bible as death. But we shall all be changed. That's what we're looking at. When? In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trump shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. So he gives us how quick it's going to be. In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. And it tells us when. At the last trump. So, this will all happen at the gathering. We often call that the rapture. The rapture is not a word that's in the Bible. So, I prefer to use Bible words. At the gathering. It's a descriptive word. At the rapture of the church. This is when it will happen. This change will take place. In fact, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 again. Page 765. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want you to follow along with me as we read verses 13 through 17. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that have died, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. How many of us, don't raise your hands, have looked into the casket of a loved one and have thought, will we ever see them again? And here Paul says, if we know one another, if we know Christ as our Savior, that we do not have to be ignorant of the fact that those that die in the Lord, we do not have to sorrow eternally over them, for we have hope. And then he defines the hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. I look over this congregation. I know a lot of you that have stood uh, right in front of the casket of a loved one. Amen? And I know the grief that's there. I just want to encourage you that there's a change going to happen. The first change occurred when they were living, and that's when they asked Christ to be their Savior, and it gave them an image. Their spirit changed. They got God's spirit. And the next thing is they need a physical change. And he says, I don't want you to be without hope. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And then the authority on which this statement is made. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away. God said my word shall never pass away. The authority of what Paul is writing is on the infallible, inerrant, unchanging word of God. That God is going to change those who died in Jesus. And he says that they which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent. That's an old English word. Two words, pre-event, go before. The Lord, it says those which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, Oh, here it is again. And with the what? The trump of God. For the trump of God shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
This is what the Bible says. The moment that we die, we are with the Lord. Our corruptible body goes to the grave. Our soul and spirit go to be with the Lord. There we wait for the rapture. And notice, if you would, those that are dead, as well as those that are alive and remain, we will be caught up together and changed from corruptible to incorruption. I like this last verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that we'll be caught up, and what's the word? Together. I often think of your mom, and all the period of time until this happens that you haven't seen her, only in your mind, and she gets a head start because she's in the soil, amen? And she comes up, and you look to your left, Brooke, and there she is. And both of you are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And up before the Lord. And you say, that's my mom. Because <laughs> I recognize him. And she goes, well, yeah. And, and the, you understand. And forever we will be. That's what it says. So shall we ever be with the Lord. The change. You see, if you don't know what heaven is, you'll never get homesick for it. But I'll tell you what, I've got some loved ones up there. Amen. My dad, like many of you, I witnessed his last breath. Life just pulled right from my fingers. Do you? I mean, just like vanished. And it broke my heart, but I know this. <laughs> Man, I'm homesick. The little boy said, I want my bed. I want the change. I want my body to be changed, my dad's body to be changed. And I'll look at him and I'll say, Dad, did you bring your white out and duct tape? Because he could fix anything with white out and duct tape. Amen. <laughs> there I have it in his little such, as pouch going with him up to heaven. Changed. 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 All of us were born in sin after Adam's likeness. And unless we are born again, we will face the consequences of sin, which is death. But if we confess our sin, embrace the Lord as our Savior, then whether we sleep or are alive, we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The gathering will take the rested and the remaining, and it will bring us together again. This is the metamorphosis of the Christian. And the joy of that is, is we get to go home. We will be changed from our vile body to his glorious body. That is the reason that you must be born again. Getting to heaven is not about being Baptist. It's not about declaring yourself to be a Christian. Going to heaven is about having a spiritual change in your life by asking Christ to be your Savior. Realizing that you have a void, an emptiness, a dead spirit, if you would. And that your only hope is not to turn over a new leaf, not to work real hard to be your best, but to invite God to give his spirit back to you. And the Bible says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Not water baptism, spiritual baptism. The question today is first not whether you'll be changed, but whether you know him. Do you know Christ your Savior? You know how many people go to church their whole life and never have been born again? It's staggering. The devil would love for us to be religious and unsaved. You must be born again. It's not fancy. It's not connected with water. It's connected with the heart's desire to say, God, I know I am vile and I need you as my Savior. I want to be born again. I want your spirit again so I can complete, be complete, body, soul, and God's spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus, marvel not that I said to thee, you must be born again. Have you ever been born again? I mean, if you sit here this morning, you say, I don't know for sure I, I have. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Acknowledge the truth. 
If you thought your whole life that you were, and now, right before you, you realize you're not, nothing to be ashamed of. There are millions of people like that. The only important thing is to take care of it now. I've told you my testimony is 33,000 feet in the air on a jet. I wasn't in church. I didn't have a pastor. I didn't have a social worker. I didn't have a a Christian worker. Nobody around me but the Spirit of God. And a mom and dad that brought me up in Sunday school and church so that I could er learn of what it meant to accept Jesus as my Savior. And on that jet, when I realized I was vile, I had lost God's image. I, on that jet, bowed my head and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell, but I don't want to. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And at that moment, when I confessed my sin and trusted in Jesus, God gave me his spirit and made me whole. If you're here this morning, you've never had that experience. Don't be embarrassed by that. Embrace it and make that confession today. Walk out of here, not religious, not Baptist, but saved born again, or as my grandma would say, borned again. And you can know. The rest is automatic. If you get the spirit problem image fixed today, there's an old songwriter that penned, ain't no grave, I know this in good English, ain't no grave going to hold this body down. One day, the trumpet is going to sound, up from the grave we'll rise, just like Jesus came out of the grave. Doesn't matter if they got a big rock under it, over the top of the, the grave opening, and guards on the side. Uh, he tore the bars away, and so will everyone that trusts Christ their Savior and is dead. And they get come up, and we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's automatic if you get the first one taken care of. Do you know him? I hope today that you do. And if not, why not today? Make that prayer your prayer as I close this in prayer. And I know you're going to be shocked at this. As long and as dry as that was, I'm out, John. I'm out earlier today than normal. Now, is there a hallelujah right there? Okay, it's weak. You want me to keep going? I got another page of notes. No, okay, I'm just kidding. Trust Christ today. Man, the greatest thing that ever happened to me is when I lost religion and found Christ instead. Don't don't be shackled with religion, the false hope that will never get you to heaven. Drop that. Embrace Christ as your personal Savior because you're a sinner, you're vile, and ask Him to be your Lord. He'll change your life and give you a purpose and a reason for living. Father, thank you for this time that we've had today. A lot of scripture, a lot of things we went over. I am sure that some folks here today are not quite sure where all the dots connect. And I pray that the Spirit of God would give them understanding, that they would understand at least this, that the change must occur for us to go to heaven. First, a spiritual change. That's our decision for Jesus. And then a physical change. Our bodies must be changed because we're corruptible. And that, Lord, we would look forward to that. Homesick for heaven. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Today we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And um, if you're with us today visiting, we practice open communion. We believe if you know Christ as your personal Savior, uh, you're a part of God's church, and we always want you to be a part of it as we celebrate today, not something that's given just to us, but something that has been given to the church, and uh, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it's a wonderful passage of scripture that Paul gave to us. Um, Because of um, all the infectious stuff that goes on, We continue to have the Lord's Supper. We'll dismiss you row by row. Come up, uh, get a cup. Uh, There's two cups together. One's the bread underneath and the juice is on top. And we invite you to join with us. As I've said before, there's only, only one reason, two reasons why someone would not participate. Number one, 
They don't know Christ their Savior, and that's a good thing. All right. Uh, the Bible's pretty specific about the dangers of, of eating and drinking unworldly. The second one is open rebellion. You know that there's something in your life, sin, and you don't want to confess it. Uh, then it's probably best not to partake. But other than that, the Bible says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. It's like, <laughs> if there's someone in here that's not a sinful person, and has not committed sin in the last 45 seconds, please introduce yourself to me. I would like to know somebody like that. But we're all sinners. We all have bad thoughts. We all have bad desires. It's, it's a part of the curse. Uh, so the Bible just says that we need to agree with God. That's the confession. God, you're right. I'm wrong. And I confess that you're right. And we confess our sins. And then and the Bible says, let a man examine himself and then let him eat. All right. Uh, there are two elements. There is the juice that represents the blood of Jesus Christ. And then there's the little cracker or wafer. And that uh, represents the body of Jesus. And as we commemorate this, Paul said, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this blood, you do show the Lord's death till he come. This is a celebration not just looking backward, but a celebration looking forward for homesick. Imagine being in heaven and Jesus sitting down just like he did at the Last Supper and breaking the bread and passing out the juice and saying, this is in memory of me. And so there's a great time. We look backwards at Jesus on the cross and through his agony. We look forward to Jesus coming back and our homesick reunion with him. We do it together. The Bible says, let a man examine himself. We're going to take a couple seconds just to um, ask God to um, see if there's any wicked way in us and confess that before them. And then after that, Andrew, if you could uh, pray for the uh, cup and Sharon, you praying for the, or is it the reverse? Okay, uh, go right ahead, run right after the other. Just give us a few moments. Lord, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us sustenance to run the race before us. As we break the bread, we feel the softness of your love for us. We smell the fragrance of your grace, you release afresh each day. We thank you with all our heart for the great price you paid when you were crucified on the cross for us. Yet just as the yeast has caused this bread to rise, you rose again triumphant over death as Lord of lords and King of kings forever and our beloved Savior. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the spirit of communion to thank you for sending your Son to save us from our sins, knowing all the while he was coming to be tortured and killed. His body was broken, his blood was shed, and his life was taken so that we could be forgiven of our sinful ways. May each and every one of us take this time to not only remember his sacrifice, but to examine ourselves and our relationship with him. As we drink of this cup and are reminded that you are the giver of life, we give thanks for not only your sacrifice, but for bringing peace to our souls and welcoming each and every one of us into a loving relationship with you. Amen. We'll dismiss the first row up here. You can come ahead and then just each row back. Come right on up and take this morning.
that fateful evening, Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he supped, this is the New Testament, my blood. Drink ye all of it. What a difference the perspective makes. We were on this side of that supper, and we know what he was saying. Those poor disciples didn't have a clue. <laughs> but we stand here, sit here today, knowing that <clears throat> there in that symbol of the bread and the juice was the picture of what Jesus Christ was going to do for us on the cross. And we do it in memory of what he did. Um, because he did that, we can be changed. Our blood problem was taken care of by the pure blood of Jesus Christ. And now we can be changed. Always enjoy uh, every church I've ever been a part of, communion. It just does something to the atmosphere and the hearts of those who know Christ their Savior. Um, it is everything I think that I imagine Christians should be. Uh, understanding, conciliatory, loving, and uh, always enjoy times that we have to be together, break the bread. We have a tradition here where afterwards we stand and grab hold each other's hands in a circle and sing that great hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. One day we'll be in heaven. Let's make the circle. <laughs> Our circle's bigger than yours. Let's sing together. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Greet one another.